Welcome to Living Waters Church, a community with Jesus at the center, shaped by scripture, dependent on his spirit, following together. For more resources, information, and news, check out our website, lwchurch.ca, and get connected. Hi, friends. Uh, my name is Dave. I'm on uh, the ministry team here at Living Waters and happy to be sharing uh, during uh, this Church Connect. Before we take a, a look at Colossians, let me, let me just uh, say to you, um, we want you to know um, this time of year that you are welcome at Living Waters Church. Uh, what a joy it is uh, to see uh, at this time of year people finding friendship, people being uh, benefiting from community as uh, people are meeting one another and getting involved. And, and again, just want to say to you that you are welcome as we, of course, join during Church Connect week after week, or perhaps there's other ways that uh, you would consider getting involved at Living Waters. You can head to our website. There are so many uh, opportunities to engage and connect and to learn. And again, we just, just want to invite you today into uh, further into the community at Living Waters Church. The title of this message today is called, You Are Filled. And we're talking uh, specifically about the infilling of Christ. Let me uh, begin by asking you a question. Do you ever have those moments where you say to yourself, or sometimes perhaps it slips out, and you just say, I didn't know that. I, uh, I find myself, the older I get, the more, the more it's happening, certainly in the area of electronics. But, but beyond that, Having these moments where you go, I, I should have known that. It, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a moment in time, passing of time. Here are some of my recent I didn't know that about the human anatomy uh, or about us being human. I, I, I wonder if you knew that it's not possible to tickle yourself. Now, I know you want to try. Go ahead. It's not possible for you to tickle yourself. But I didn't know that. Uh, it's not possible to hum while you are holding your nose. Now, you can go ahead and try that as well. It's impossible also for most people to lick their elbow. I'm not going to try that. It's impossible for most people to lick their elbow. Another fun fact, a man's beard is the fastest growing hair on the human body. It may grow to nearly 30 feet long if over the course of a lifetime, if not trimmed. Wow, that's quite a that's quite a that's quite a thing. It's quite a look. And finally, a human sneeze regularly exceeds over 160 kilometers an hour. Boom. While our coughs clock in at about 100 kilometers an hour. Wow, fun facts with Dave today. One of the things that we're taking a look at today is is one of those things about wow. It's sure important to know if we don't know. And that is, as we will read at our text in just a moment, in Christ, in Christ, we have been brought to fullness. In Christ, we have been brought to fullness. We need to know that. Colossians 2.10 says it directly and very plainly. In Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Now, let, let's read that fun fact in the context of the verses surrounding Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 10. So then, just as you received Christ, Jesus says, Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. In verse 9, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. In verse 10, and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. That's reading from a New Testament book called Colossians. A brief summary. This letter to the Colossians is a very well-articulated response intended to remind Christians of the significance of the Lordship of Jesus Christ 
and his sufficiency in meeting their needs in every area of their life and afterlife. This so, so, so radical is uh, the concept of salvation by grace apart from human works that those steeped in Old Testament law found it very difficult to grasp and perhaps we still do in some ways today. So again, the book, the first half of the book of Colossians is a theological treatise that includes one of the most profound explanations and imitations of Christology anywhere in the New Testament. And the second half offers a mini ethics course addressing most every area of Christian life. And in the center of this is this profound statement and invitation, in Christ you have fullness. We should be curious as we take a closer look at verse 10, where it says, in Christ you have been brought into fullness. What does this mean for you and I? This promise and reality does not need to be one of our, oh, I didn't know situations or statements. The word full means wanting nothing, and it's applicable to Christians. It means that a Christian has everything necessary for life and godliness, happiness and immortality. This fullness is one of the treasure house of the church forever and ever. Paul said it again in another way in Ephesians. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Peter said it this way, his divine power has given us unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So duly noted, Paul, Peter, in Christ, we've received all things, all spiritual blessing, duly noted, Christ has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. This is, perhaps this is an important question though. If Christ has given us so much, Why sometimes do we not feel or experience this? Could it be that Christ is over-promising and underperforming in our lives? A good question is, how often do we feel full? Perhaps we sometimes feel the opposite. We feel lacking and longing, and because of this, we feel weak. Perhaps we're most aware of the gap between God's promise of fullness and our reality of lack and longing. And minding the gap, perhaps, is what we're talking about today. We, it's not sufficient for us to day by day and week after we're week and season by season to just simply say, well, I'm, I'm just one beat work of progress and, and chuckle and be dismissive about it. In verse 10, Paul reminds us that in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. So again, no Christ, no fullness. This passage of scripture is asking Christians to flip the switch in order to get our minds off of ourselves and onto Christ where fullness lies. When we continually make statements about what we feel rather than faith statements about Christian life and experience, we will not flourish and perhaps be quite content about this gap and quite satisfied with being a simple work in progress and dismissive. Again, I'm not here talking about a lack of authenticity or being naive or too proud to admit our truest experiences. But this verse reminds us that the gospel message does not start with us. It starts with Jesus and what he declares over us and invites us into and has actually given to us. For from the cross, Jesus said in John 19, it is finished. What's finished? A Christian, upon receiving salvation, is now perfectly complete. So let's not flip the switch and make coming to Jesus all about what we say and what we've done or even what we're experiencing. 
We come to Jesus because of his invitation, because he has made a way for sinners to repent and find forgiveness and new life in Christ. And upon receiving Christ, we are brought to fullness in him. We need to know that. We need to know that. Paul knew the lifestyle and history of the people he was writing to, the church in Colossia. And again, the gospel, though, for them and for us is not so much about what we give to God as it is what God gives to us and wants to keep on giving Christians as he seals the work of fullness within our lives. This is grace. Our narrative is framed by our boasting of Jesus' love for us and what he offers us. So as you read in our text, in verses 6 and 7, we receive our fullness in him as we accept Christ's continued invitation for three things. We now live in him, and number two, we are now rooted and built up in him, and number three, we are now strengthened in the faith. So notice the narrative. Paul is flipping the script on people that had built their faith narrative on what they had done as they fulfilled the Old Testament law and practices. He's flipping the script and saying, now this is about what Jesus offers you and his ability to keep you and your ability to remain in the fullness of what Christ has given to you. And again, all happening and all possible to be said and shared because of our union with Christ our living, our rooting, and our strengthening as we are in union with Christ. When we think about growing in Christ according to what we are feeling day in and day out, or by the long list of things we feel we are trying to get done or over the line, we are in danger of making Christianity all about us and our works. Again, we must flip the script. We ought to think about Christianity in terms of what Christ has and wants to do for us, his work in us and for us. <laughs> Move along with this, and we can see the script that Jesus wanted his disciples to follow. And that is found in Matthew 5 and John 6, where in these verses, Jesus said, Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Paul later picks up on this and talks about fullness. Jesus here promises a filling or a fullness. In John 6, whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Who whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So again, fullness. Um, hunger and thirst quenched by who? By Jesus. So again, notice the script. Union with Christ Fullness in Christ is found on a path of dependency in Jesus' active work in our lives for those that hunger and thirst will be full or find fullness. What this tells us is that there is nothing that will affect us more and affect our walk with Jesus than our hunger and our thirst, what we do with it, our hunger and thirst for righteousness. So as Christians, we let's get practical. As Christians, we believe that each of us have a soul that makes us ourselves. Our soul is what informs our thinking, our loving, our doing, and our being. And we believe that our soul needs to be nourished in ways similar to our physical bodies. When someone is talking about being fed or watered, hungry or thirsty spiritually, this is what we are referring to, the nourishment of our soul, the filling of our soul, the fullness of our soul. So as we pursue union with Christ, what does Jesus say will satisfy thirst and will satisfy our hunger so that we remain full and we remain with our thirst quenched? So let's take a look at that. Number one, we are invited and we are, um, we are informed, we are Asked, we are called to feed our soul with the bread of life. Again, so that we will be filled and find fullness. Feed our soul with the bread of life. This is Jesus' instruction. John 6, Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The Bible refers to Jesus as both the word of God and the bread of life. And the Bible uses bread to mean that which is taken into the body and provides nourishment. So again, our spiritual hunger is to be towards and for the bread of life, the word of God. As we discussed, the Bible refers to the word of God as the bread of life. And if we are spiritually hungry, we will find ourselves longing for more of the word of God, to be filled with the bread and word of God. We should note that like physical hunger, the longer you go or we go without nourishment, and you can track this, the less hungry we eventually become, very depleted, very vulnerable. This is not a good place to be. Enter, entering, perhaps even without realizing, into a type of, um, you know, what some doctors would call starvation mode. But again, consider the parallels. If we have less and less of a desire for God's word, or even no desire for God's word or interest in reading the Bible, we need to take an honest look at this. For we've got an invitation from Christ, instruction from Christ, and if we're not tracking along towards those accepting that invitation and those gifts, we need to take an honest look at this. Jesus tells us that only those who have a spiritual appetite to hunger and thirst will find true satisfaction and true health. One Christian writer said it this way, we experience spiritual hunger when we yearn for the Lord, aching for a deeper relationship with him. The more we fill our lives with Christ, the bread of life given to sustain his followers, the more our relationship will grow and satisfy the needs of our soul. But often we don't feed our spiritual hunger with food that satisfies, so the ache inside us potentially grows. And that distance between us and what Christ has for us can lead us to tremendous places of vulnerability. We're asked to thank God for the fullness that we have received. We're to thank him for it, and we're to pursue the filling of that. In Psalm 107, verse 9, it says, The redeemed sing that he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry, the hungry soul he fills with good things. One writer said, Unsatisfied spiritual hunger can produce sin. When these sins begin to mark our thoughts and actions, it's a sign that we are not filling ourselves with the bread of life. Unsatisfied spiritual hunger can be ravenous, grasping for anything close to that which resembles sustenance. Understand what the junk food of life is. This junk food tempts us with false promise of rest and escape, but none of these things sustain our souls. Ultimately, it is Christ that fuels our faith and satisfies our growing, sp- growing soul filling our souls with delightful but non-nourishing things will not stop the longing within us. It may satisfy us temporarily. It may feel like enough. However, in the end, our souls are left wanting and still longing for the true nourishing satisfaction of a deeper relationship with God. We were designed for fullness in Christ. Unsatisfied spiritual hunger can lead to selfishness. Like physical hunger, Our unmet spiritual hunger flares up selfishness. We believe our own needs are, we can come to that place of believing that our own needs are most important. And we will want what we want, and we want it now. When we hunger for the Lord, but we don't feed our souls by spending time with him in his word and in prayer, our level of selfishness inflates because we're needy people. We will fill our lives with what we think sustains us at the moment, perhaps potentially becoming the center of our own universe 
And as Philippians 3, 9 says, our unmet desires become our false gods. Finally, one writer said, unsatisfied spiritual hunger can lead to spiritual wandering. The further we are from the Lord and our hunger, the shorter our responses become, not only to the people around us, but also to the Lord's promptings. When unsatisfied spiritual hunger takes control, we don't want to hear the commands of the Lord, live obediently to his will, or consider how we may be sinning. But again, it doesn't have to be that way. Close communion with God fuels our desire for closeness and to serve him, please him, and receive his correction. When we drift away from the only food that will satisfy our hearts, we no longer show grace, accept correction, or demonstrate patience. Last season in our men's meetups, we heard from a, an individual guest speaker three times, and I said many important things, one of which I was impressed by his example. When he kind of pulled the curtains back a bit into his daily practice, and he shared a little bit about his morning routine of beginning his day reading his Bible, which he showed us. He had a physical Bible in his hand. And he says, that this is where, this is how I begin my day. Why? His passion and his need for filling was to hear from God's word first. I'll never forget the example. I'm inspired by it. We all need to be inspired to hunger for the word of God, to hunger for the bread of life. Secondly, let's take a look now not just at hunger, but at thirst. John 7, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. In order to know what spiritual thirst is, we first must know what spiritual water is. Living water, as mentioned in the book of John, is a way of describing the Holy Spirit and Christ's work within us. When we become Christians, the Bible says we receive the Holy Spirit. We receive living water. This means that a new relationship begins. We find that the Holy Spirit honors the covenant we make with Christ by residing within us to bring about new life, to bring us this fullness. And our spiritual thirst can be quenched by living water. How beautiful and uniquely lame, named our churches, living waters. Some 35 years ago, uh, the leaders at the time, um, through the seeking and uh, collaboration, decided that what would best to describe a people and the purpose of a people and the hope for a people is to place a name or a spiritual community called Living Waters Church to be identified not by a, 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 a physical address or a postal code, but to be defined by an invitation that Christ wants us to accept and be filled with living water. Uniquely, uniquely named, appropriately named for people that are on a spiritual journey together. We need, because of our thirst, to receive living water, to be full and filled. Receiving is the main thing. Knowing and asking are not the main thing. We need to receive and be filled. See, there's certain things that we can only receive from one source. So we have to flip the script. We don't fill ourselves. We don't feed ourselves. There's no substitute. There's no dupe. There's no knockoff. There's no duplicate. We receive life from God and we receive that which sustains us spiritually from God. The bread of life to fill our hunger and living water to quench our thirst. So as we consider Jesus' invitation, we need to know about living water. We need to ask for living water and we need to receive this living water. So becoming spiritually thirsty as when we long for the Holy Spirit to work in our souls, our hearts are waiting earnestly, our conscience is telling us that we need to be filled, our emotions are full of health as we prioritize receiving, our will is surrendered as we make the main thing the main thing. Jesus says, in Christ you are full. We are to know this fullness. As 
we continue to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. He renews our minds and our actions, and we will be more motivated in love toward God and others. Notice while thirst, in this sense, is a good thing, a thirst going unsatisfied is not, just like hunger, if not met or fed, is not a good thing, as is thirst. It, if we're thirsty over long periods of time, we become um, deprived, and de de deprivation can lead to dehydration. Just as each one of us understand clearly what our physical bodies don't get the water we need, we have negative symptoms of a dry mouth, thick tongue, achy head, and weak muscles. Spiritually, if we don't get the amount of living water we need, our, our souls need, we get spiritual symptoms of de deprivation as well. We aren't spending time being filled and transformed by the Holy Spirit. You'll notice potentially our us, us, us expressions of the flesh. We lose our temper. We feel waves of, of, of worry and a growth of guilt and selfishness and fear. And these are all signs of a dehydrated spirit. It doesn't have to be this way. So our text reminds us that Christ and life, life and living is first and foremost about Christ. We've got to get that script right. And we receive our fullness in him as we accept Christ's invitation to, to live in him, to be rooted and built up in him, to be strengthened in him. And as we are filled through hungering and thirsting for the right things, which are all found in Christ. So as we close, let's just take a look at the last, the last two verses. Two things to stay full and focused. Verse 7 says, again, knowing all that we receive from Christ, what's our response? And verse 7, overflowing with thankfulness. We are called to flip the script. We are called to overflow with thankfulness. Thanking Jesus for what he has given and promised us. Thanking him for the gospel. The life we have, how our roots are built up in him, how he strengthens our faith. This is our narrative. What we have received in Christ, we focus upon and we're thankful for. With the warning in verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Simply stated, don't flip the script and go back to making the gospel about you. The gospel is all about Christ, what Christ has done for you and wants to do in you. So much so that Jesus said, I, in Christ, in me, you have fullness of life. Wow. What good news. What hope. Despite what we feel, despite what we're experiencing, we are called to hunger and thirst and be filled from a beautiful source, a beautiful relationship called Jesus. In Christ, you have been brought to fullness. So as we move along in this new season, let's hunger and let's thirst for this fullness for we will be filled. God is calling you. God is calling us as a community into a new season to prioritize health and vitality. It's all because of the invitation of the gospel. So as we close in prayer, may each one of us pray, Oh God, fill me with the bread of life. Oh God, fill me with living water that I would know the fullness of, of Christ within my life. Not just through knowledge that establishes, but through experience that nourishes us. Heavenly Father, today we thank you for all that you have given to us. I pray for each one that gathers in this simple form of Church Connect. Those that are participating today, I pray Holy Spirit, right now for this infilling of life and love. Father, we, we seek after you. We are hungry and thirsty people. We long for all that you have for us. We thank you for the gift of salvation 
And with this gift, we give our lives back to you so that you would take and you would fill us to all that you have on your mind. Lord, come into our hearts, come into our lives. We thank you for, again, this very generous offer this season to each one of us that we would know of your generosity as you pour your spirit upon us, as we, are, as we feed ourselves of the bread of life and as we drink freely of this living water that you offer us. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for filling us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, friends, uh, thank you uh, for studying uh, God's word with me today. Um, yeah, I always, always curious on, on uh, what, you've, what you've thought, what your experience is. And that certainly would be all those who serve on our ministry team. Um, again, we're, we're in your corner. We're believing God with you that this would be an absolutely fantastic season of growth and life in Christ. Hey, God bless you. Have a good rest of your week. Thanks for joining today. If you'd like to get more connected or involved in any way, please reach out. We'd love to help. Have a great week.